Fantastic. So good morning and welcome to Practical Magic, the Resilience Potion and Security Chaos Engineering. Everything in software, like in life, is a system in transition. I think we all know our requirements will, are, will evolve and our context will change. And in fact, they're changing all the time. But not all software engineers actually design for change. They don't design for an evolving context. I would argue poor engineers design for other engineers. Mediocre engineers design for the future that they imagine. But good engineers design for change. And this means good engineers want to sustain resilience in their software and systems because that gives them the ability to adapt to those evolving conditions and contexts. If we pursue resilience, if we're designing and developing for change, we can improve software quality actually at the same time as security too. One thing I would love for you all to take away is that security is a subset of software quality. So there's a lot you can do as developers to help nurture this. Of course, the natural question is like, how do we do this, right? What are the principles and practices and tools that can help us sustain software? What can we adopt to help us nurture resilience in our systems? That's what we're gonna talk about today, and specifically by imbibing what I call the resilience potion, which is a metaphor for the traits that we seek to sustain resilience in our software, and that's gonna guide our exploration today. So we'll go through each ingredient, there are five of them, and explore a few opportunities for how we can cultivate it when we're developing and delivering. First, what is resilience? How many of you are familiar with like software resilience? Yeah. There are also like a ton of buzzwords around the topic, so I always like to clarify what it really means. We can start with, very casually, the nature of reality, which is that failure is inevitable. And failure is just a part of, a natural part of complex systems as they operate. Our software is also a complex system, but our beliefs about it don't always align with reality. The software we design, build, and operate reflects our mental models. Mental models are formally design, uh, defined as our cognitive representations of external reality. So basically it means we hold in our heads like this little otter, like a smaller scale representation of how we think the world works. In software, we implement a design and then that reflects a mental model. And then we create a subsequent mental model of how our implementation works. We've got like nested mental models here. Every time you encounter a bug, for instance, that's the difference between your mental model and reality. It's how you expect the world to work versus how it actually works. Mental models, though, are dynamic. They change as a system changes. They change as context changes. And that makes them highly dependent, obviously, on that context. Understanding your system's context is no small feat. Like, it's pretty easy like, to understand the first iteration in your software. But I like to think of software, especially distributed systems, as this kind of like fractalizing dragon spiral. It's just impossible to really mentally model and understand systems that are the result of years of iteration. I'm sure a lot of you all have been there. You enter a new company, you encounter software that's been built over a decade. You're like, oh my God, how does this even work? It feels impossible to understand. This is why surprises, things like bugs, feel especially fraught in our ex exceptionally complex software systems. So I love this quote by evolutionary biologist Lynn Margulis who eloquently described the element of surprise as the revelation that a given phenomenon in the environment was until this moment misinterpreted. In essence, a surprise is an open challenge to our mental models of our software. And this means, as Dr. David Woods very pithily puts it, we must prepare to be surprised. We have to prepare to be surprised. And this preparation involves adaptation. So what is adaptation? Well, what we see across all sorts of complex systems, whether that's like in nature, ecology, economics, uh, our brains even, um, is that successful complex systems are adaptive. They change and evolve over time and space, especially in response to their changes in their external environment. Preparing to be surprised is really about adaptive capacity. And adaptive capacity reflects how ready or poised a system is to change how it works its behaviors, its models, its plans, processes, procedures, to change all of those things so it can continue to operate in a world featuring surprises and other vagaries. And resilience reflects this need for sustained adaptation, that we have to prepare for failures and opportunities alike to thrive. More formally, because I like, again, getting everyone on the same page definition-wise, resilience is defined as the ability to prepare for prepare and plan for, absorb, recover from, and more successfully adapt to adverse events. 
Okay, so now we're at a security chaos engineering fit in. Honestly, if I had my druthers, I would just call it like resilience engineering or software resilience engineering, but I don't have a time machine, so it's called security chaos engineering. And the way I define security chaos engineering, which I have the luxury to do so because I wrote the book on it, is a socio-technical transformation that enables the organizational ability to gracefully respond to failure and adapt to evolving conditions. Security chaos engineering really recognizes that we have to make sure our mental model is clear and then observe reality to refine that mental model. We want to align them as much as possible. Also, this means we can design for change. We can be good engineers that understand that all of our software success depends on context. So as part of the security chaos engineering transformation, which is again, really a transformation towards resilience, we can imbibe the resilience potion to help us on our journey. So what is the resilience potion? By the way, that is Chaos Kitty. If you haven't met Chaos Kitty, it's gonna help you on your journey to resilience. And yes, I have stickers that will be at the book signing upstairs after this, so come get them. So resilience potion, what is it? There are five common features that uh, define resilience, which we can frame as five ingredients in a resilience potion recipe for fun. It makes it a little more memorable. We can brew this elixir to foster resilience in our systems and guide our security chaos engineering transformation. I like to think computers, they have crystals inside, crystals that are literally like vibing out. So of course we need to have a little like magical feeling to our work. First ingredient in our resilience potion is the, defining the system's critical functionality. This is the system's reason for existence. What we care about is how the system performs its core operations when undergoing some sort of stress or adverse conditions. This is represented by milk in the resilience potion. Obviously you don't spill it everywhere, doesn't have to be cow-based milk. I saw there's lovely plant milks, you choose. Second ingredient is defining the system's boundaries of safe operation. These are the thresholds beyond which the system is no longer resilient to adverse conditions. The system can only absorb changes up to a certain point and stay within its healthy state of existence. And this is represented by dried hibiscus in the potion. The third ingredient is observing the system's interactions across space-time. Because complex systems involve many components interacting with each other, the resilience can only be understood through system dynamics across space and time. Different behaviors will unfold over time and across the topology of the system. This is represented by cacao beans in the potion, which if you didn't know, you have to ferment them. Fourth ingredient is fostering feedback loops and a learning culture. The resilience depends on remembering failure and learning from it. Feedback loops in which outputs from the system are fed back in as inputs in future operations are essential for systems resilience. This is represented by chili peppers in the potion. The final ingredient is flexibility and willingness to change. This is that adaptive capacity we talked about earlier. We also need to sustain this flexibility over time to keeping the system flexible enough to change in response to changes in operating conditions. This ingredient is represented by squishy, flexible marshmallows in our potion. You couldn't piece it together. The end result is a very tasty, spicy, quite redolent hot chocolate. Not quite the time of year for hot chocolate, but it's still worth trying out. So how can we brew this potion when we develop and deliver software? There are lots of opportunities. We'll talk about a selection of, the, of them today. The rest are in my book that's precisely on this topic of resilience. So how do we harvest the first ingredient of our resilience potion, understanding the system's critical functionality when we're writing code? When we're implementing critical functionality by developing code, our aim is simplicity and understandability of critical functions. So let's explore a few opportunities to realize the same. One practice is what I call the airlock approach. So whenever we're building and delivering software, we need to define what we can throw out of the airlock so the question to ask is like, what functionality and components can you neglect temporarily and still have the system perform its critical functions? Another way of thinking about it is, what would you like to be able to neglect during an incident? Whatever you answer, make sure to build the software in a way that you can indeed neglect whatever those functions are uh, as necessary. By the way, it turns out this is slanted, so I don't wanna have like a you know, we're trying to be resilient here. So uh, this applies equally, by the way, to performance incidents and security incidents. So if one component is compromised, the airlock approach means you can shut it off if it's non-critical and contain that contagion. For example, if processing transactions is actually your system's critical functionality and maybe reporting isn't, you could, should build the system so you can throw reporting out of the airlock 
and preserve resources for your core function, which is processing transactions. It's actually possible that maybe reporting is your most lucrative function. It's your money printer going like brr. But because timeliness of reporting matters much less than processing transactions, that's still the thing you want to throw out of the airlock. You can still sacrifice it. Second opportunity we'll discuss in terms of critical functions is choosing boring technology. So how many of you read the post by Dan McKinley, Choose Boring? Okay, a few of you, great. I'm excited to teach you something new. So highly recommend reading it, but what Dan says is boring is not inherently bad. We think of boring as a bad thing, but it's not actually. Boring likely indicates well understood capabilities, which is what we want. That helps us wrangle complexity and reduce the preponderance of what I call baffling interactions in our systems, the things where we go, oh my God, that can even happen in our software. So this means both our systems and our mental models of the systems are easier to grasp if we choose boring. Software engineers really should be making choices, um, whether languages, frameworks, or tooling uh, that solve, uh, best solve specific business problems. Like the end user really doesn't care that you use the latest and greatest tool hyped up on Hacker News, or that's going to get you like a lot of points with other engineers. The end user wants to use your service whenever they want, as quickly as they want, and with the functionality they want. That's it. That's all the user cares about. Sometimes solving those business problems will require new fancy technology if it grants you some sort of competitive advantage or like a market moat, or otherwise fulfills your organization's mission if you're not a for-profit company. But even so, I'd like to say be cautious about how often you pursue non-boring technology because if you're living at the bleeding edge, guess what, that takes a lot of blood sacrifices to maintain. So you're probably thinking like, okay, but Kelly, you really don't understand. What if this new shiny technology is like really, really, really cool? So you know who else loves shiny new software? Attackers. They love when developers adopt new tools that aren't well understood yet because that creates lots of opportunities to take advantage of mistakes, misconfigurations, sometimes even intended functionality if it hasn't been sufficiently vetted against abuse. The point is, if you optimize for the least worst tools you can for as many of your non-differentiator problems, then it'll be easier to maintain and operate software that's safe and resilient. Last opportunity we'll discuss today in the realm of critical functions is standardizing raw materials. So we can think of raw materials in software systems as languages, libraries, and tooling. They may not be tangible, we can't touch them, but they're materials nevertheless. We can really think of these materials as elements that are woven into the software that need to be resilient and safe to ensure the system overall is resilient. So yeah, we're going to talk about memory safety, which I feel like is the hottest trend on, you know, the spring, summer 2023 software quality runways. I feel like every conference is talking about it. Like even, uh, what is it, the Consumer Bureau, I forget the name of it, like they've been talking about memory safety, everyone is. Is anyone here a big fan of memory safety? No one here is a fan of, okay, a few people. Okay, well, hopefully I'll get you to become evangelists. So uh, if you aren't familiar, memory safety protects mistakes in memory management in one part of the program from affecting the rest of the program. So it makes it so matters of memory resource management are handled by the language and runtime itself. It frees up cognitive load if you're a developer. I think it's not really a keynote without some hot takes, so I'm gonna give you some, which is that you can actually think of C code like lead it was really convenient for a lot of uses, but it's poisoning us over time, especially as more of it accumulates. And memory unsafety is actually mighty unpopular in most programming languages. So we actually have a lot of opportunities if we want to refactor when we're writing new code. So think Go, Java, Ruby, Rust, C Sharp, and Swift, just as a starting point. Dependencies can also be hazardous raw materials. So an important tenet is that you own your dependencies, which we can acronymize to YOID, because I like to copy Gartner, who makes acronyms out of everything. So we YOID, therefore we yeet. You can remember that, right? So we need to ensure our dependencies don't constitute some sort of hazardous raw material, and then we yeet them out if they do. We don't want them in there if they're a hazardous material. So think about uh, how many of you were familiar with the code of compromise, 2021? Okay. Like one person, you all were very lucky. Um, so this is when attackers modified CoCov's bash uploader script and caused a supply chain nightmare. A lot of people had to work overnight in order to make sure that everything was safe. So it was especially bad because, uh, bad because devs had to add this like horrible bash script into their build pipelines. And, like CoCov could have chosen not to do this, and they didn't. 
but also true is that developers could have chosen uh, to not use CoCov, or they could have actually fully vetted the installation process, the design, um, or thinking through the end order effects of what might happen when you have to add this into your build pipelines. It's like, to me, you can feel the radioactive heat from here, we don't want it. So as a general principle, you wanna consider those end order effects. What are the kind of like second and third order effects that happen from your raw materials when you're developing and delivering? So remember, attackers will happily vet these designs for you, um, and they're going to surprise you with their findings, and we don't want to be surprised in this way. So it's better to adopt that YOID mindset, the you own your dependencies mindset, and vet what you insert into your systems first, including your, again, language, library, and tooling choices. Then, of course, you want to meet out the ones that are insufficient and find superior alternatives. Finally, sensitive data can also be thought of as a hazardous raw material. At least, you know, when there's a breach of like customer's payment data, that's generally not advisable and causes a bad time. So rather than requiring like a billion hours of security training, I have to take it too. I don't think anyone likes that kind of security training. Instead, we can propose breaking it apart a system or an application to smaller services that have isolated access to that sensitive data. So the billing service maybe will still have access to payment data because it has to, to perform its function. But now the rest of the application, all of the other services that make up its functionality, those aren't gonna have access to that data. You can even just outsource payment handling to a third party. That's actually one way of kind of infusing isolation in your system. Now that we understand a few ways to support critical functionality during dev and delivery, we can go to our second ingredient. So the second ingredient in our resilience potion is understanding the system's safety boundaries, so thresholds beyond which it slips into failure. But we can also help expand those boundaries when we're writing code. We can expand our system's figurative window of tolerance to adverse conditions. So rather than relying on everything being perfect ahead of deployment, which is impossible, remember, nature of reality, failure is inevitable, we want to be able to cope well with mistakes and failures because fixing them is a swift, straightforward, repeatable process. Weaving this kind of sustainability into our build and delivery pipelines helps us expand our system safety boundaries and gain more grace in the face of adverse scenarios. The good news also is a lot of getting security right is just solid engineering. There are things that you want for reliability and resilience to things other than attacks as well. So in the security chaos engineering world, security is just a subset it's a facet of software quality. So security is a facet of software quality. A key question that then emerges is, given your constraints, we all have constraints, we have finite brain power, resources, and everything else, how can you write high quality software that achieves your goals? The practices we're gonna explore, again, very briefly, for expanding our safety boundaries actually beget higher quality and more resilient and secure software. So we can start with anticipating scale and how it relates to safety boundaries. When we're building resilient software systems, we want to consider how operating conditions might evolve in the future. Again, everything's dependent on context. We want to think about where the system's safety boundaries lie today and how they might change in the future. Despite our best intentions, I think we all know as software engineers, we sometimes make architecture or implementation decisions that induce either reliability or scalability bottlenecks. I think anticipating scale is one of our ways to challenge our this will always be true assumptions. I'm gonna drop another like super elegant acronym, which is TWABT assumptions. Uh, so this will always be true. These are the things that we assume to be invariants. Consider an e-commerce service, right? Uh, we might think on every incoming request, we first need to correlate that request with the user's prior shopping cart, which means making a query to this other thing. There's a this will always be true assumption baked in. I don't know, anyone catch it? which is that this other thing will always be there. If we're thoughtful, then we have to challenge with, okay, but what if this other thing isn't here? What if it's slow to load or it's unavailable? And this can refine how we build something. When we're building components, especially that will run as part of like big distributed systems, part of scale is anticipating what operators will need during incidents. If it takes an on-call engineer hours to figure out that the reason for sudden ser service slowness is like a SQLite database that nobody knew about, it's gonna hurt your performance objectives. Anticipating scale also matters a lot for resilience against attacks because attackers love to challenge or target our this will always be true assumptions, those TWAPT assumptions. 
These assumptions can manifest in every part of your stack at every level. Like parsing the string will always be fast, or messages that show up in this part of uh, this port will always be post authentication, or an alert will always fire if a malicious executable appears, and so on. I'm sure a lot of you are now thinking about some of your this will always be true assumptions that you've maybe taken for granted. Second opportunity we'll discuss regarding safety boundaries is standardizing patterns and tools. Standardization can be summarized as ensuring work produced is consistent with some sort of preset guideline. And standardization helps reduce the opportunity for humans to make mistakes by ensuring a task is performed the same way each time. Human brains aren't designed to do that at all. So in the context of standardized patterns and tools during development and delivery, we mean consistency in what developers use for effective interaction with the ongoing development of the system. Simplest tactic, prioritize patterns and in parts of the system with the most meaningful implications if something goes wrong. Like where would there be the biggest impact? Things like authentication or encryption, right? We can think of these as hazardous methods to go along with our hazardous materials from earlier. So how do hazardous methods look? How many of you have heard the folk advice, don't roll your own crypto? Okay. Okay, lots of people. So actually we can generalize this advice pretty well. Like you shouldn't roll your own database, shouldn't roll your own logging pipelines, observability and so forth either. And hazardous methods can manifest as injection from an attack perspective. Like SQL I injection, uh, SQL injection can be characterized as the result of rolling your own database query builder. It's an interesting way to think about it. The favorite warning box in my book is this like little scorpion boy, he's all angry saying don't DIY middleware. And you might be tempted to roll your own, again, authentication or cross-site request forgery, XSRF protection, but outside of edge cases, it makes far more sense to standardize on some sort of middleware for those cases. That way you're leveraging the provider's expertise in this exotic area. It's kind of back to that choose boring principle as well. We want to choose libraries that fit best with our architectural choices. And if it's gonna be difficult for your team to like build out these standardized patterns and tools and so forth, you don't have all the resources, you can also just identify standard libraries or standard providers that you can then provide as a list in some sort of accessible documentation. That way teams know that there are these well-vetted libraries and providers that they should consult and choose from when they're trying to implement specific functionality. Fewer libraries also means fewer components to update, which is nice in general. This brings us to the necessity of paved roads. So paved roads, common in platform engineering, Netflix has talked about them a lot, not so common in security or resilience, but they should be. So paved roads are well-integrated, supported solutions to common problems that allow humans to focus on their unique value creation. For a lot of you all, your unique value creation is creating differentiated business logic for an application for your code. Making it easy for you all, uh, for developers to add authentication to your product, that's a paved road. So is making it easy for developers to add logging or DDoS prevention or security header validation. All of that makes for a great paved road. Final opportunity we'll cover today for understanding safety boundaries, at least in part, is understanding our dependencies. So dependency analysis, especially in the context of uncovering bugs, including security vulnerabilities, helps us understand the faults and failures in our tools. And that way we can fix or mitigate them and stay within the system safety boundaries or even consider better tools that help expand them. We can treat this practice as a kind of hedge against potential stressors and surprises and allows us to invest our effort elsewhere and expand our safety boundaries. Because this is a keynote, it means I already have a soapbox, I have a captive audience, so I'm gonna dispel some InfoSec uh, BS that they try to inflict on you as developers. So when should you care about a vulnerability? Let's say a new vuln is being hyped on social media, do you drop everything and fix it and is it the most important thing in the world? Probably not, honestly. So whether you care or should care about a vulnerability depends on two factors, just two. First, how easy is it to scale and automate the attack? For a lot of vulnerability researchers, no matter what they're hyping, it is not easy to scale the attack and it is not easy to automate. Second thing, how many steps is the attack from the attacker's goal outcome? 
like if the attacker has to like ride dolphins to jump through ring zero and like traverse the memory landscapes of Mordor, that's not easy. They're many, many steps away from their goal. So takeaway for you, thinking about attacks, is that attackers rely on their ability to take advantage of interactions and interconnections in your software. That brings us to the third ingredient, which is observing system interactions across space-time. When we're developing and delivering systems, we can support this observation and also form more accurate mental models as our system's behaviors unfold over time and across the topology of the system. Looking at a single component at a single point in time tells us very, very little from a resilience perspective. We can also make interactions more linear. Uh, that curtails the number of baffling interactions, those surprises that happen. There are practices and patterns we can adopt or avoid that help us make those interactions more linear. I discuss linearity at length in the book, but let's dig into a very small selection of opportunities today. So we can start with testing and how to be thoughtful about it. So uh, not sure if anyone is already familiar with me. I ask a lot of spicy questions. I can't help myself. So one today, if you want to sound smart at like a cocktail party, you can borrow this question. It's like, as a discipline, are we testing for quality or resilience over time? Are we testing just to say that we did testing? Are we just checking a box? The latter is like not based at all, as the kids say, but I think it happens a lot more often than we'd like to admit. The tests we write are an artifact of our mental models at a single point in time. But because reality evolves, including the systems and workloads within it, tests obsolesce. So the insights we can learn from chaos experiments, which we'll talk about next, as well as real incidents and even the system's healthy operation, those have to be fed back into our testing suites to ensure they're reflective of production reality. We need to prioritize tests that help us refine our mental models of our systems, especially as their context evolves. How many of you have integration tests in your day job? Okay, that's honestly, it's better than I was expecting. Sometimes it's pretty low. Um, I think integration tests are underrated. I don't know about you all. Um, integration tests obviously observe how different components in the system work together, usually with the goal of uncovering those kind of baffling interactions, right? Verifying that they're working and interacting as expected. This actually makes integration tests, again, a valuable first pass at uncovering those surprising interactions. Attach me vulnerability. I'm guessing not many of you are familiar with that, which um, that was a cloud isolation vulnerability in Oracle's cloud infrastructure. That's an example of what we hope to uncover with an integration test and also an example of how hazardous it is, hazardous it is to only focus on the happy paths when we're testing and developing in general. So the bug allowed users to attach disk volumes for which they lacked permissions um, onto virtual machines that they controlled in order to access another tenant's data. So if the attacker tried this, they could initiate a compute instance, um, attach the target volume to the compute instance under their control, and gain read-write privileges over the target volume. So then they could steal secrets, um, expand access, or potentially even gain control over the target environment. So aside from this attack scenario, this is just like something we don't want to happen in our multi-tenant environments for reliability reasons too. So to address this, we could actually develop a few different integration tests describing a variety of activities in a multi-tenant environment, like attaching a disk to a VM in another account, uh, multiple tenants performing the same action simultaneously on a database, or spikes in resource consumption in one tenant. As a general principle, we want to conduct integration tests that allow us to observe the system interactions across space-time. This is far more useful to foster resilience than testing individual properties of individual components like a unit test. I am totally a hater of unit tests. I think they're very much that like checkbox testing. Because a single component, uh, a single input in a single component, that's simply, it's just insufficient for reproducing system failures in tests, especially catastrophic failures. So how can we test even better? With chaos experimentation. How many of you are familiar with this? Chaos experiments. Okay, a decent amount, that's good. So our goal is to uncovering, again, those baffling interactions, all those surprises that happen in our systems by revealing the way the world actually works and how it differs from how we expect it to exist. We can do so through chaos experiments, which are just resilience stress tests for software systems. So chaos experiments simulate adverse scenarios to see how a socio-technical system behaves end-to-end -end in response to those scenarios and those adverse conditions. So it can be technical, it can be something like the adverse scenario of machines dying, or it can be socio, like an incident runbook not being available. So we're gonna be, again, good engineers designing for evolving contexts, 
good engineers designing for change, we need to continuously learn about that system context. And adopting that experimental capability allows us to do so. It's actually a really important way we can keep up with our ever-evolving systems. So as an example, to make this a bit more concrete, we could start with a user story like, ensuring authentication is consistent is hard for my engineering teams. But if our critical services fail to authenticate incoming traffic, we might experience service disruption or worse, downtime and violate customer trust. Maybe there was even an incident where an important service failed to authenticate incoming traffic um, or request properly and then leaked some sort of unauthenticated data. That can make it even more imperative to solve this kind of problem. So we can create an experiment that shows us which services automatically require authentication versus the services we think require it. Again, reality versus our mental bubble. By conducting an experiment, we can expose all those inaccuracies that are lurking in our mental models. We can formulate a hypothesis of what could and should happen during the experiment. So in our example, it's in the event of unauthenticated traffic, we expect our service endpoints will respond with an authentication challenge. If they don't, that we alert on it. So we'll collect all this evidence of how activity in our authentication endpoints manifest in our logging and, uh, logging and monitoring pipelines. So the big question we want to ask is, is our organization's middleware present in everything we deploy? If not, we want to see what happens. Maybe sometimes the middleware is misconfigured. A chaos experiment really isn't about this like true or false answer. Again, we're trying to generate evidence of behavior across the system to help us learn and also to inform change. Let's say our hypothesis was proven incorrect. Not all services are validating authentication. And also, we're not generating alerts about it either. That's a problem. Maybe it shows up in the logs, but the associate part of the system, maybe you all have been there, so inundated with alerts like they didn't realize it. This again could inform a few design changes. So um, we could have an opportunity to redesign whatever the middleware is to make it a little easier to use. Or we could update our observability pipelines if the data isn't driving recovery. We also want to analyze the data with regards to the hypothesis. Again, do all endpoints validate authentication properly? For those that don't, what information are we collecting about that traffic? Were there other failures associated with the scenario? Did we receive alerts elsewhere? Can we distinguish unauthenticated traffic from properly authenticated traffic in our observability tools? Did anyone report any support issues, like through customer support? So there are a bunch of chaos experiments we can also consider. I like to think I have almost like Pinterest boards of chaos experiments in the book, chapter eight, pages and pages. But we can think about things like disabling non-critical roles and functions in an API, disabling resource limits, generating large loads on specific availability zones or data centers, turning off API authorization, injecting canary credentials or keys into code, scripts, and logs, injecting inspired OAuth tokens into builds, overriding build logs, deleting log files, Disabling access to DNS or exfiltrating large volumes of data like data egress. Creating and scheduling new jobs via the automation service script console. Then my favorite, time traveling on a host, changing the host time forwards or backwards. That one's a lot of fun. Now, chaos experimentation facilitates learning and that's precisely the fourth ingredient in our resilience potion, feedback loops and learning. When we remember system behavior in response to stressors and surprises, we can learn from it and use it to inform changes to improve system resilience to those events in the future. We need ways to summon, preserve, and learn from these memories to create a feedback loop when we're developing and delivering. So the main opportunity we're gonna talk about today is distributed tracing. So it's really difficult as humans to look at the little breadcrumbs left by the system when they aren't brought together in a narrative. Humans very much think in terms of stories. So whether you're triaging an incident or refining your mental model to inform improvements, observing interaction over time is essential. You can't form a feedback loop without being able to see what's going on. Like it's just a loop. It's not a feedback loop, right? So we should plan for and build this feedback into our services through tracing and logging. Neither one, though, is something you can bolt on after you've delivered your software. You can't apply it automatically to all the services you operate. This needs to be defined when you're writing the code before it's delivered into production. So how many of you all are familiar with distributed tracing, have interacted with it? Okay, quite a few of you. That's good. Um, so for those of you unfamiliar, I'm excited to teach you. So distributed tracing is a very specific slice of observability, and it's a really powerful way to observe the flow of data as it moves through a distributed system. So distributed tracing really lets you like stitch individual operations back to the original event. 
We can assign a trace ID at the point of traffic ingress. And that trace ID follows the event as it flows through the system. So as an example, let's consider a case where an attacker is exfiltrating data from a hospital's patient portal. We often don't think about distributed tracing in the context of security, but it's really useful here. So we can see data is being exfiltrated, but how is it happening? So let's say there's a front end service that's responsible for displaying the dashboard, the patient sees when they log in. Probably you all have all logged into your hospital's uh, patient portal. Sometimes they're a little jank. But this patient portal service, service needs to request data from services maintained by other teams, like the token service to log in, the lab service to display lab, lab reports, maybe also this like schedule service to play, display upcoming appointments, right? So the front end service makes a single request to the patient portal service. The patient portal service makes the request to all the other services. But maybe the lab service is mixed between in-house lab reports and some sort of third party lab reports or partnered uh, outsourced lab work. So the in-house lab service can maybe read from the internal database and properly check user IDs. But to get the partner lab reports, you have to use this integration service. And as you can see, like we're already three services deep, even if in this simple example. So let's say the team associated with the partner lab service discovered they made a mistake. They accidentally introduced a vuln and now an attacker is exfiltrating data. They might be able to say what data is being sent out, but they won't be able to trace it back to that original event. They need to somehow follow it through all of their requests, and that's going to be a nightmare because it's unclear which operations or events might even make their requests to the partner lab service, let alone like which ones are from a legitimate user versus an attacker. All of that traffic that's associated, or that's coming to the service is associated with internal teams from peer teams, but that traffic is associated with some sort of user operation that's external to the company, like again, a patient clicking on the dashboard. Distributed tracing though can dissipate this nightmare because it assigns a trace ID at the point of traffic ingress, and that trace ID follows the event as it flows through the system. So that way, the partner labs results service can just look at where the trace ID appears in their logs, and they can coordinate across the other services to determine where that event's route was throughout the system. So again, distributed tracing not only helps us observe system interaction, interactions across space-time, the third ingredient, but it helps us refine system design and design new versions. It gives us that really elegant feedback loop. The enterprise scale, you just don't have complete visibility into how all these other teams are using your service or accessing your service. Their incidents can easily become your incidents. So when you're refining the design of your system, you want to understand the impact it has on those tree of consumers. The more partners and consumers you have in the chain, the more difficult it is to understand the chain. And this is why our software systems are messy. They're really complex. So you have a mental model of how events flow through the system and how your specific part of the system interacts with all the other parts. But how accurate is your mental model? Distributed tracing helps you refine that mental model by learning about real interactions in your system and between its services. So we can use distributed tracing to plan for capacity to fix bugs, inform consumers of downtime or API changes, and a lot more. Distributed tracing, though, again, I want to emphasize, in essence, is making the statement that you want to be able to correlate data across systems, that you want that trace ID. But it's during dev that you have to make the decision to integrate this, right? You can't bolt it on afterwards. So in a way, it's kind of ensuring you have the flexibility for recovery in the future. That brings us to our final ingredient, which again, is squishy marshmallow, which is flexibility and willingness to change. For our last ingredient, we want to remain flexible in the face of failures and evolving conditions that would otherwise disrupt our success. So Martin Kleppman, if you haven't read his book, highly recommend it. He puts it best in saying agility in product and process means you also need the freedom to change your mind about the structure of your code and your data. That fits perfectly with this last ingredient. Now, nature is a very patient architect. It allows, uh, it allows evolution to bloom over generational cycles, and it means we need to be patient too. We need to have carefully architected evolution as well. We need strategies that encourage this evolution and also interweave this willingness to change by design. We need to promote the speed on which that adaptability, that adaptive capacity we talked about at the beginning. We have to promote speed because it depends on speed. You can start with preserving possibilities for the refactor. I at least think, and I've done this myself, when writing code, like we're usually swept up in the electrifying anticipation of the release, we're not peering out to the hazy horizon of like, oh, this is gonna need to be refactored, right? It's much like movie crews aren't contemplating the original when, or contemplating the remake when they're filming the original, right? It's kind of like demoralizing to think about. 
Except our software, unlike in movies, it's not a one and done thing. We don't have like our big like film premiere and then like right off into the sunset. We really need to anticipate that the code will change and we have to make decisions that support the flexibility to do so in the future. Okay, how does this look in practice? So at a high level, we need an easy path to safely restructure abstractions, data models, and approaches to our problem domain. And type systems, of all things, can actually help us. Uh, the traditional view of type systems is that they're a way to resist change, um, but type systems can actually facilitate change by showing you what parts of the system are affected by the ripples of your changes. So this is very much like a second or third order effect of type systems that's often overlooked. So type declarations are a tool we can wield to preserve possibilities, though I certainly acknowledge the subject is contentious. So how many of you are familiar with the nerd fight in type systems land? Oh, someone's got two hands up, they know. Okay, so I'm not gonna go into the nerd fight um, entirely, um, but if you're uninitiated, uh, you can go check out probably through some very salty email lists, um, but you might be wondering what type declarations and type systems are at all. It's a fair question. I'm not going to go into the rabbit hole today. I'm just going to give you the TLDR to understand how it can help change. So type systems are meant to prevent the occurrence of execution errors during the running of a program. Uh, type is a set of requirements declaring what operations can be performed on values that are deemed to, be, uh, to conform to the type. So types can be concrete. They can describe a particular representation of values that are permitted, or they can be abstract, which describes a set of behaviors that can be performed on them with no restriction or representation. Static typing can make it easier to refactor software since type errors can guide the migration. The more we can encode into the system, um, into the type system to help the tools assist us in building safe and correct systems, the easier we can actually refactor and change our code. For instance, if we pass around like N64s everywhere to represent a timestamp, we could just call them timestamps, right? That's a lot clearer. That way we avoid accidentally comparing them to or mistaking them to like a loop index or for a day of the month. But in general, the more clarity we can crystallize around the system's functions, remember that first ingredient on critical functions, we can crystallize that down to the individual components, the better ability to adapt the system is necessary. So refactoring code to add useful type declarations can ensure our mental models, developers' mental models of our code are more aligned to reality. Second opportunity we'll discuss for uh, nurturing flexibility and willingness to change is modularity. I have another hot take, forgive me. Uh, software engineers fundamentally misunderstand modularity with respect to software quality and resilience. I think we're not thinking about modularity in a sufficiently complete fashion. There's a tendency to mistake the architectural boundaries of your system for physical boundaries. So you have two services where one sends data to the other, the naive way to look at that is say like, okay, the service that's sending the data can be down, it can be unavailable, that second service isn't gonna be affected. That's not true because one service can flood the other service with data. There are actually so many interactions that can subvert that boundary in any sort of boundary. So what's the right way to think about modularity? So according to, yes, the US National Park Service, modularity in complex systems allows structurally or functionally distinct parts to retain autonomy during a period of stress and allows for easier recovery from loss. I know it's the park system, but this is actually a pretty fabulous definition of what we want to achieve in our software. So modularity is a system property reflecting the degree to which system components, which are usually densely connected in the network, can be decoupled into separate clusters, which are sometimes referred to as communities. We may only think of modules in terms of software, but humans have actually intuitively grasped how useful modularity is for socio-technical systems resilience, for literally thousands of years. So just one example, in ancient Palestine, modular stone terraces grew olive trees, grapevines, and other produce. It's a very natural part of like how we operate in the world. During a disturbance, a modular unit or feature can persist or function independently of all of the rest of the modular features and units. So it really proffers looser coupling between modules. It grants more independence between them, which quells the contagion effect. Brief example, John Muir Historic Site. There are multiple blocks of multi-species, multi-variety trees that foster resilience to frost. This is a very clever architecture, it's a very clever design. It ensures that if frost damages some of the trees, um, there can still be some fruit yield. Like, there's not gonna be a total loss. So resilience actually doesn't come at the expense of efficiency, it enhances it. 
So whether we're talking about cultural landscapes or software landscape, when there's low modularity, failure cascades will pervade. Low modularity enables those contagion effects where a stress or a surprise in one component can lead to failure in most or all of the system. So we often see performance contagion, where a stalling service can cascade performance problems onto other components in the system. But security instances are also worse when there's low modularity. Like ransomware relies on low modularity. Attackers want minimal boundaries between things. They would really love to be able to access one component in the system and gain access to all of the things. That's like a dream for them. So a system with high modularity, however, can buffer or contain those stressors and surprises so they don't spread from one component to others. This idea of containment is really the key to modularity. So modules allow for basic encapsulation and isolation of concerns. They create a local boundary upon which we can introduce this isolation. So we're going into a little love letter to isolation briefly. So isolation is a very core property that helps us sustain resilience in our software. It's an important way we can be good engineers designing for change. It's also a really great example, frankly, of how lucky we are to work with software systems. Like we can isolate failure to handle unexpected interactions. Most other complex systems domains can't. Like you can't introduce physical isolation in like an airplane, nuclear reactor, or petrochemical plant. It's just not possible. So really, we should leverage this blessing to its greatest effect. Now, isolation doesn't require like super elite feats of engineering. I'm not expecting you to be like wizards, right? Sandboxing is actually pretty well established at this point. I would argue it's an example of boring technology. It's pretty well understood. You can start with things like AWS or GCP security groups, or use things like serverless functions, containers, and VMs for the things you can. More on the obscure side of isolation, if you want a little inspo, an emerging approach is to tra trap C code in a WebAssembly sandbox to isolate, isolate hazardous subcomponents. So the foreign function interface wrappers are generated automatically, so it's like a pretty slick DX. Might even be useful for applications that are entirely written in C, so you can trap all of the hazardous parts, things like format parsing, in a sandbox too. So if the vulnerable component is in a sandbox, the attacker has to surmount another challenge before they reach their goal. And most attackers really don't want to do something like a double sandbox escape. Um, if it sounds hard, it is, and attackers really like reducing the amount of effort they have to expend. And at a more localized level, we have modularity for organizational purposes, which makes navigating and updating the system easier. It also provides a level of logical linearization, where data flows in one direction, but pressure and false disruptful linearity that's even if the modules aren't isolated. Also a case where our chaos experiments and resilience stress tests can show you to what extent your modular boundaries are working as you expect. We may have modularity in the we can evolve parts of the system independently sense, but not in the, the operation of these components as independent sense. It's really easy to confuse the two, especially when we spend all of our time building the system and not really babysitting it. By the way, we shouldn't babysit it, but it does mean we have bias. Finally, we can employ the strangler fig pattern for change. Sometimes we may be willing and eager to change the system. Hopefully I've convinced you of how great being able to be flexible is, but we don't know how to do so without potentially contaminating our critical functionality. So the strangler fig pattern can support our capacity to change, even for the most conservative of organizations, which helps us maintain that flexibility. It also allows us to gradually replace parts of the system with new software, uh, components rather than attempting like the Big Bang rewrite, which is as destructive as it sounds normally in practice. So adopting this pattern really allows us to keep our options open and we can understand evolving context and we can feel prepared to evolve our systems accordingly. So in a browser delivered service, for instance, you could replace one page at a time, starting with your least critical pages. You can collect evidence. Um, once the redesigned component is deployed, then you can deploy the rest. And the same goes for writing those like beastly on-prem monolithic mainframe applications as well, right? Especially if they're written in a hazardous component like C. The strangler fig pattern allows us to pull out one function and rewrite it in a memory safe language like Go. It's in effect, again, the conservative approach, but often the faster one. So again, the big bang models often all break things without the moves fast, since tightly coupled systems are really difficult to change. But technology is only one part of changing, right? It's only one part of the transformation with the strangler fig pattern. You can adopt new tooling and you can move functionality to a new environment, you know, fancy serverless stuff, but the old ways of humans interacting with the technical part of the system likely won't change overnight. Mental models are often really, really sticky. 
So whoever owns the new process sees it through the lens of their old process. You can think of it as one ritual is being traded for another. So the new principles that we adopt when we're changing our system, those need incremental iteration too. At the core of our principles, again, has to be that willingness to change. Oops, that's unfortunate. Speaking again of adaptability, here we go. So again, willingness to change, that has to be at our core. We have to provide the socio part of the system with the psychological safety to make mistakes and try again. We have to feel safe enough as humans to be iterating our own approaches. So we can save our potion. We concluded our journey through the ingredients in this very select sampling of opportunities. What do we need to remember from here onward to brew our potion? So resilience means organizations respond to failure and adapt to evolving conditions, to evolving contexts. Remember, good engineers design for change. We can foster the five key ingredients we need to brew the resilience potion during development when we're writing code. We can define our critical functions and prioritize preserving them in adverse conditions. We can understand and expand our system's boundaries of safe operation. We can observe system interactions across space-time. We can also make them more understandable. We can foster feedback loops, ensuring that we learn about our systems quickly to inform change. And finally, we can remain flexible in the face of failures and evolving conditions. We can remain ever poised to change and be good engineers. So again, these were only a selection of opportunities I discussed in the book. So if you enjoyed this, you'll love my new book with the very long title, really the second part of the book. Uh, the second part of the title is more indicative. Just came out, I'm dying for you to read it. You can actually get a copy upstairs right after this along with the Chaos Giddy stickers. With that, thank you very much for your time and attention.